as Tom mentioned, I'm here to talk to you about squirrel conservation and the power of people within it. Uh, it's really important for um, all the help yet. Um, my name is Marianne, or Mac, and I'm one of the conservation officers. I cover Argyll, the Trossachs, and Stirlingshire. Um, so all the yellow areas on this map are the regions that our project covers and mine is the one highlighted in red there. I do sneak out of my area on occasion um, for very good reasons I might add um, but generally I tend to focus in this patch. Um, so just a bit of an overview about the talk today just so you got an idea of what I'm going to be talking about and the format of it. So they're threatened. Then a bit about our project Saving Scotland's Red Squirrels and what we're doing to try and conserve them. And then a little bit about the activities that we do and how people help us to do those activities and how important they are in that. So a bit about red squirrels. So their scientific name is Socorus vulgaris and they're part of a very special group of just squirrels on their own, which are called Socoridae, which means shadow tails. They're classified as rodents, so very similar to rats, mice, guinea pigs, and that's partly because they have four sets of teeth um, right at the very front of their mouth that just continue growing throughout the whole of their life so they have to eat really hard things so that it wears those teeth down otherwise they just continue to grow. As their name suggests they do tend to be red um, however they do have a big variation in their hair colour so you can see even from the two um, pictures here that they're quite different in coloration. You've got this one at the top here that is more um, likely to be seen in the spring and summertime when they have their um, summer coats and it tends to be a bit of an orangey red. A lot of kids have told me that it's an iron brew coloured squirrel um, so I've kind of pinched that off of them and um, you can often see quite a blonde tail as well and the darker one as well but they can also be a grey colour, they can be white or black, so they can have such a huge colour variation. We do have to be quite careful when, we're, um, when we catch a really quick glimpse out of the corner of our eye because they can be mistaken for grey squirrels as well. These two here, you can see they've got red paws and that's a bit of a giveaway, but they need to sit still for long enough. They've also got ear tufts and they've got slightly more delicate features. Just have a quick overview of the difference between the two. So red squirrels tend to be a lot smaller. They're about the same size as a can of soup. They tend to look quite athletic in comparison to the greys. As I mentioned, um, even though they're called red squirrels, they can have quite a big color variation. They always have the white tummy, but then so do greys. They have ear tufts, but these are only really visible in the autumn and the winter, probably acting a little bit like a woolly hat to keep their ears warm. And then in comparison, the grey squirrels tend to be quite a lot bulkier. They're almost like the bodybuilders of the squirrel world in the UK. They're twice the size of red squirrels. They tend to be grey, but can have kind of red tinges, as you'll see on their hair there, and their um, heads, and a little bit on their tail. They never have any ear tufts at all. They look like little uh, mouse ears. But another characteristic is a white bit of hair around the edge of their tail, or a halo, that is also known. And that's a bit of a distinguishing feature that red squirrels never have. So moving back to red squirrels on the ring, um, they're found in quite a lot of places around the globe. So across the whole of Europe, Scandinavia, right through Russia, and of course in the UK and Ireland. In the majority of their range, they're actually quite happy and safe and really good population sizes. It's only in the UK and Britain that they're actually threatened. It used to be common across the whole of the UK. There's now thought to be about 160,000 in the UK as a whole and three quarters of that population is found in Scotland, so we're extremely lucky here. So historically, they were found everywhere. Each of these little flags with the squirrel face on is where there were red squirrels and no gray squirrels to share those areas with. And as you can see more present day, a depiction from 2012, there's very few of those flags. In fact, there's only one just at the very top um, in the highlands and across into Argyle as well. All of these other areas, the reds have to share those areas with grey squirrels and that can lead to a few issues. So what happened? Um, where did they all disappear to? So there's a couple of things that affect squirrel populations. Um, severe winters can be quite a big thing. So at this time of year the youngsters are getting kicked out of where they were born because the parents want to live there and um, they're having to find new territory. So they've got to find somewhere that's really good. They don't necessarily know what they're doing. And because of this quite a lot of youngsters don't survive their first winter and if it's a severe winter, really um, high snowfall, really really cold, then that can um, make the mortality rate even higher. 
they have to find their food in the autumn time around now and bury it. They don't hibernate. They have little food stores everywhere. So they need to understand what they're doing and do that really well. They also have to maintain their drays, their nests up in the trees. And if they don't do that well and insulate it really well, again, that can lead to problems. Thankfully, that doesn't happen too much. And actually, we've had a really mild winter between 2019 and 2020, which means that all the squirrel populations have boomed, which has been fantastic. The other things that we've done more directly um, is we've cleared woodland. So it's thought that a squirrel used to be able to go from the east of Scotland right across to the west without touching the floor, just through the branches of trees. As I'm sure you can imagine, that's not really possible anymore. We are trying to put in more woodland corridors, but it takes time to rebuild that into place. This woodland's cleared not just for forestry, but also for development, for places for us to live and for agricultural reasons. So we have changed the landscape quite a lot for them. The other thing we've put into um, the woodland is roads. And they're, unfortunately, they're not very good at crossing roads. We've also started bringing them into our gardens. So people love field feeling, feeding wildlife, which is fantastic. Although it does mean they're in closer proximity to dogs and cats that we have in our house. And there have been instances of um, both dogs and cats managing to accidentally get red squirrels. Quite often it's the kittens that they get. Now these things we are very aware of. Thankfully, they don't have too much of an impact on squirrel populations. They do have a bit of an impact locally, depending on what the situation is. We can put things in place like making sure our forestry and, and woodland management plans are really good, making sure we don't cut down whole massive areas of forest, and making sure we replenish that when it is cut down for whatever reason, trying to put mitigation measures in by roads, making sure people are aware that a squirrel could be crossing. Unfortunately, there's not too much evidence to show that road signs and rope bridges work, but we're still trying to look at other ways. We can maybe cite our feeders out of the way of our pets. Unfortunately, the big thing that's causing a massive issue to red squirrel populations across the UK are the grey squirrels, and it really is um, the biggest threat out there at the moment. So grey squirrels are um, from America originally, the eastern grey squirrel, and two ways in which they affect red squirrels is competition and disease. They were introduced in the 19th century. Victorians really liked going around the globe and moving things around, partly because they didn't have cameras or phones to take a photo and bring back to show people what they'd seen. So they actually brought the animals back instead to show people, and quite often they'd bring them back for gifts in large estates as a bit of a wealth um, kind of nobility. Unfortunately, grey squirrels outcompete the red squirrels for food and habitat. They're just a little bit too good at being squirrels. Uh, they're not as fussy as reds, therefore they really can take over and eat anything. They're naturally found at much higher densities. So in a patch of woodland, you'll find a lot more grey squirrels um, housed and able to survive in there with enough food and places to hide compared to the same amount of red squirrels in that area. They have a higher reproductive rate than red squirrels do, which, and they can also breed at any time of the year. They're not restricted in any way. Um, unfortunately, red squirrels, they really rely on how much food is available the previous autumn and to how many kittens they can have the following year. This isn't really um, an issue for grey squirrels, they really can breed any time. Um, and we've seen kittens in January, for instance. Unfortunately, the other thing that's happened is um, they've managed to take over quicker than they would normally just on their own because they can carry a disease called squirrel pox virus. It's lethal to red squirrels, but it doesn't actually affect the grey squirrels. And partly for a result of all of these reasons, it's actually illegal to release a grey squirrel anywhere in the UK. If you accidentally trap it, I've heard of a couple of stories of them getting stuck in bird feeders. Um, unfortunately, the only way um, to deal with it, as it were, is um, to euthanize it. So I touched on squirrel pox briefly, and I'm just going to um, follow on a little bit of that. Um, my apologies, the pictures are slightly graphic, um, and I will go through this quite quickly because I know they're not the nicest. So it is a major threat and it really is something that's helped the grey squirrel move um, and take over as quickly as it has. It starts with small lesions around the eyes, a little bit like myxomatosis in rabbits. It causes blindness, sores on the mouth, feet, ears, everywhere essentially. It means they become really disorientated, they can't move very much and they become really malnourished. They have very little immunity and they tend to die within about two weeks of infection. A couple of individuals do survive. Um, we don't quite understand um, why those individuals survive and it is very few and far between that they do. Because they don't move very much when they are ill, um, it does mean that it's the grey squirrels that are carrying this virus and spreading it to the different red squirrel populations and individuals in those populations. And it's from sharing resources and habitat that they take care so myself and Kaylee work for Saving Scotland's Red Squirrels. It's a partnership project 
um, led by the Scottish Wildlife Trust. The other partners are Nature Scott, which was um, Scottish Natural Heritage until a couple of weeks ago. Scottish Forestry, which was the Forestry Commission until last year. Um, Scottish Land and Estates, the Red Squirrel Survival Trust, RSPB Scotland. And then we're also funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund um, for five years up until March 2022. And in this region in particular, I'm also supported by the Loch Lomond and Trossachs National Park, which is where I would usually have a desk rather than in my bedroom. So the project was first um, put together in 2009 with the idea that it was a nationally coordinated attempt to protect red squirrels. That's not to say that nothing was happening before, it's just that we needed a really good overview of what was happening nationwide and try and have a concerted effort with the big kind of conservation um, partners all on board together trying to tackle this. The idea is to try and stop the decline of Scotland's core red squirrel populations. They're really important for the UK as a whole anyway. Um, as I said, we've got three quarters of the population that are in the UK. The other aim is to work closely with local communities. So the full name of our project at the moment with this stage of funding is Saving Scotland's Red Squirrels Developing Community Action. And I'll go into a bit more detail about that shortly. And generally, it's to try and improve the conditions for red squirrels across the whole of Scotland and to combat the spread of the grey squirrel any further. So our project can be broken down into three main areas, partly because of the presence of grey squirrels and how they interact with red squirrels. So for most of the maps you'll see in the rest of the presentation, red is where red squirrels are, blue is where grey squirrels are, and purple is where there's red and grey squirrels, so the overlap areas. In this you'll see that there's a purple area of grey squirrels up in Aberdeen, which is not connected to any others, so they're not having any others moving in. So the aim up here is to have complete eradication of grey squirrels. So there's nothing north of this hash line here. In this central area where I work, we're defending this line, which is based around the Highland boundary line, fault line. With the idea, we're gonna try and reduce all of these grey squirrel populations further south and then as far below that line as possible and then move the line when we're able to, to try and stop them encroaching any further north into those pristine red squirrel areas. We're also keeping an eye on this grey squirrel population here and trying to find out where squirrel pox is within it because it hasn't reached this area yet. And then in South Scotland, where it's very similar to Wales and England, where you have a really big overlap of both of the species, we've got areas of priority, uh, priority areas for red squirrel conservation. There's a couple more than there are on here. And these are really good areas for both red squirrels and their habitat. So we're focusing on these areas and ensuring that we remove as many greys and protect those patches um, as much as possible and try and reduce the rate of squirrel pops getting into those areas as well. So for the majority of the rest of the talk, I'll be talking about the area that I cover in the central area. So we have a couple of different activities um, that are the main things we do. We look at the populations. We need to know where those squirrels are to be able to focus our efforts. We do grey squirrel control. And we also um, test the grey squirrels that we do control for squirrel pox virus to find out where it is in the country. Without people, none of that would be possible. We obviously have our staff team. Um, at the moment in this area, it's just me because we were mid recruitment when COVID hit. Um, I usually have a grey squirrel officer. Um, we're currently recruiting now, so if anyone's interested, it's worth having a look at the Scottish Wildlife Trust vacancies page. Um, the closing date for that is the end of September. We work with a lot of stakeholders, such as Agati Red Kites um, and other organisations, both tourism, potentially, um, other wildlife organisations, as many people as we can possibly work with to try and get the word out about the project and, and that we want to know about squirrels in that area. Volunteers are a really key um, part of what we do, and we definitely couldn't do as much as we do without them. They do many different activities, so they work as great squirrel controllers for us, they help us survey, they also help us with public engagement and spreading the word about squirrels. We work quite closely with local communities, as they are the people in those areas um, to protect their red squirrels, as it were, and then members of the public also help us on an ad hoc basis too. So one of the activities we do is keeping track of squirrels, and it really is the most important because it helps um, with understanding where our other activities need to focus. We do feeder box surveys and we also use camera traps. You can see here a squirrel will reach into the feeder box to get some food and then jump back out again. What we do is we put a little sticky tab on the lid of that box so as it jumps in it'll leave some of its hair behind 
and we can then look under a microscope to see who's been visiting. This means that we can actually find out that where squirrels are without people having to be there too, because sometimes we're not in the same place. And this gives us a long term idea of what's happening across Scotland. So we have hundreds of sites all over the country that we um, survey on an annual basis. We also do feeder surveys outside of this too, in key areas. Within each of these little squares is four feeder boxes. So that's quite a lot and they're visited multiple times. And we end up getting fantastic maps like this, where again, the red boxes are where red squirrels were found, blue are where gray are found, and purple is where there's a mixture. These are the ones around Dune and I've two red kites here. Uh, so in 2018, you can see that there was a bit of a mixture of reds and greys. So it helps us get a good understanding of long term. Volunteers are crucial in this aspect. Um, within my area alone, there's 45 different survey sites times that by four boxes that have to be visited at least three times. I could not do that alone. Um, I don't think anybody could. And so people donate many different hours um, in helping us with the survey. They make the feeder boxes for a start. Uh, they help us install those feeder boxes and put up wildlife cameras if necessary. Um, sometimes we need to find out if there's squirrels in the area, so they go out and survey first, look for nibbled cones and signs of squirrels, and then put the feeder box up so that we can understand which species are visiting. They then actually carry out the survey, as you can see here, this person's filling up um, with more bait and more food and then they'll put a sticky tab on. They'll also then revisit and take that sticky tab back off and then disinfect the box. People also give us a hand analysing the hair samples under a, a microscope and then people very kindly go through all the camera footage as well and you would not believe the amount of times a red squirrel can visit a feeder box in one day. So we're extremely thankful for all of that. The other thing that we do to keep track of squirrels and that actually anyone can help us with is our sightings page on our website. Each of these little red dots is where somebody has reported red squirrels, either one or a couple, and all of the grey ones are where grey squirrels have been reported. And anyone at all can submit their sightings. We validate them all, and it's what we're doing this um, week during Red Squirrel Awareness Week is our Great Scottish um, Squirrel Survey, and trying to get as many people to report their sightings as possible. These are really key because it helps us understand exactly what's happening um, at any time of the year, and like right now, and I can refer you back to this map with our little hash line. This is approximately where that is. And we know that there's grey squirrels in this. There's none further up anymore, which is fantastic news. But if one was to sneak in that way, we know where it is and we can um, go to that immediately to try and push them a bit further south. So they really do help us with the most up-to-date information. So they're extremely valuable and only people can help us with this. Um, it helps us understand where the populations are. It helps us where they're moving through where they use as highways or corridors of different woodland. It can also help us see if there's red squirrels under pressure anywhere. So for instance, if there's a lot of road casualties um, or if they're on the edge of a development site, just to make people aware and put in mitigation measures. They can feed into planning decisions and also any decisions on felling trees. And it really helps um, to confirm that the areas that we're working in are the best areas for our conservation activities. And without other people, there's no way that we'd have known that there was a red and grey squirrel actually either side of this tree. Um, I wouldn't have seen it, somebody else did, because you have to be there at the right time in the right place. Sightings have been even more important this year than normal. Because of COVID restrictions, we've had to reduce a lot of our activities or cease them completely. Um, it means that a lot of the information that we get from being out on the ground, doing control efforts, doing other surveys, we don't have, it's just not there at the moment. And so it's been really valuable for people to report their sightings um, and be our local ears and eyes on the ground. And it's really proved to be um, people that have helped us this year just understand what's going on in the wider world. From people's sightings this year, we have discovered that red squirrels have moved back into new areas that we didn't know they had been. So a really good one is down here in Falkirk. Um, suddenly a population of red squirrels has appeared. Not quite sure where they came from, but they're there. Um, we've now discovered that there are so many around um, Bridge of Allen, Dunblane and across Dune towards Calendar, which is great. Red kittens have also been seen in some places for the first time ever, such as on the edge of Dunblane. Um, they may have been in the woodland already, but actually because people have been at home, they've maybe looked out their window a couple more times and actually noticed red squirrel kittens coming to their garden as well. We've also learned a lot more about grey squirrels. Um, unfortunately, because of all our control efforts were stopped, grey squirrels have started moving back into some areas they had been um, controlled from. 
And it's also highlighted the routes that they may use. So again, areas that we can focus our efforts on. You can see this chart on our sightings website. And this is how many red and gray squirrels are sighted each year um, from 2016. You can see in 2016, there were just over 3,000. Last year, there were 9,400. And when I looked at the website about an hour ago, it was 12,740 something. Um, so this year really has proved to be phenomenal. We do have to be a little bit careful with sightings though. As you can see from this chart, a lot of people report their red squirrel sighting, which makes sense, we're saving Scotland's red squirrels, but actually we also need to know about grey squirrels and sometimes that's more important because they are starting to move into areas that they had been removed from and we need to know about that because we're not there to see it. Um, so it is really important, but it can mean that the sightings can be skewed a little bit, which is why we need things like the feeder box surveys. So we have to be careful in interpreting the results. You can see from the maps here, one from 2010, you'd think that there were hardly any squirrels anywhere. And that's just because people didn't know to report their sightings. More present day and this year, you can see we've got a much better picture of what's going on. But it really does rely on people and squirrels to be in the same place and that doesn't always happen. They're really helpful in getting us the most up-to-date information. It highlights the key areas that we need to work on and can confirm if we are working in the correct areas. Because squirrels move so much, that can obviously change as well, so we need the most up-to-date information. This time of year is especially important because the young are dispersing out. As I mentioned before, they're being moved away um, from the area they were born, and so we can track and keep an idea of where squirrels are using to move out. And it helps us have long-term information about what's happening and what our actions are then contributing to, such as red squirrels moving back into Agati red kites. All of our sightings and our fieldwork data is fed into the National Biodiversity Network. That's nbnatlas.org. It's the UK's largest collection of biodiversity information, and it's a resource of decades of different sightings of all sorts of animals, including red squirrels um, and gray squirrels. And it's a really good way um, with all your sightings that are reported to the website. They're also fed into this and many different um, council planning offices, anyone looking at development will look at this to see where the hotspots are and where they have to be careful of red squirrels as they are a protected species. So it's really worthwhile and helpful for sightings, not just for us, but for everyone in general. So they're really key in red squirrel conservation and without this, all of our activities would be extremely difficult to do. We'd have to go and find out what was there first and we could miss things or it could change by the next time we go. As I mentioned, grey squirrels have been moving back into areas um, that they had been removed from. Um, we've also had dispersal routes highlighted of where they're moving through. The, uh, one of the other activities that we do is targeted grey squirrel control. So we focus on specific areas. Again, there's lots of people that are involved in this, uh, project staff when they're in post, uh, volunteers, homeowners, landowners, estates, lots of different people. Um, we run a trap loan scheme so anyone can help out um, to varying degrees, even just hosting a trap in your garden rather than um, having to uh, control the grey squirrel with um, various different levels that you can help out with. We'll do full training on that too. And there's also government grant schemes that we help estates such as the Gartier Red Kites get onto um, in particular regions to help with this because it really needs to be um, landscape scale. We do this by live trapping um, because we are, do tend to work in areas where there's red and grey squirrels but it does mean that we get some really interesting information and we know a bit more about where red squirrels are too. As I mentioned before it's illegal to release a grey squirrel once trapped therefore the only option is to humanely dispatch or euthanize it and we also um, use them to take a blood sample to find out where squirrel pox is in the population. So there's a couple of different reasons why we control, particularly in specific areas. So we try and reduce competition for red squirrels. So we know there's red squirrels close by. We try and um, reduce the impact of the grey squirrels on those populations. We're trying to prevent the spread of grey squirrels even further across the country. We're trying to reduce the risk of squirrel pox infection to the reds, particularly in those areas in the south of Scotland. And we're also keeping an eye on where squirrel pox is in the grey squirrel population. So a bit more specifically in this area, and particularly with the Gartie Red Kites, there's a fantastic um, story that comes out of it, partly through grey squirrel control and what has been achieved in having more present day um, with red squirrels and I think two, maybe three hides, someone can correct me later, um, that now have red squirrels visiting daily, which just wasn't the case a couple of years ago. So we've been working with them since 2012 um, with the feeder boxes that I was mentioning earlier. And we have these fantastic maps showing us who was visiting at that time. So in 2012, 
there was only grey squirrels shown in this blue square here. And then last year, there was a mixture of red and grey. So we can track this over time because we've got this long term data set. 2012, there was only greys. We missed 2013. And then in 2014, red started to come in. 2017, we didn't see any grey squirrels, but then 2018, greys were starting to move back in again as well. So it really helps us understand what's going on. And it also shows the effort that the grey squirrel control that was implemented helped the reds come back in. And we can see this by the number of captures um, as we were doing the control effort with this live trapping. Well, I say we, Tom and team. Um, we can see how many grey squirrels were removed and then also how many red squirrels um, were trapped and then released. And as you can see over the five years of the government grant scheme, um, starting in 2011, there were a phenomenal number of squirrels um, trapped in year one and then it decreased a lot because you'd already removed some. Red squirrels then started to come in. Unfortunately, the grey's still sticking around, but the red's still sticking around too. And um, now more present day, they only tend to get the odd grey squirrel um, bouncing around and they're now back on the government grant scheme in 2019. They didn't actually catch anything last year, which is good. We saw some, um, but we think the pie martins may have helped out with those. But it's great to see that um, it's working. It's also worked in other areas, a bit more of a um, contrast. So in the south of Scotland, around Dumfriesshire, um, this is from an estate that started on the grant, um, got over 80 grey squirrels. They had a small population of reds already. Again, year two, similar situation. Year three, a bit of a boom in the greys, but also a boom in the reds. And then complete reversal, and they were then catching more red squirrels and greys in the fourth year. So grey control really works to help um, boost those red squirrel populations. It really shows that as you move greys, uh, the reds will come back in again without having to reintroduce them. So it's a fantastic story, particularly in this area where we've constantly got greys coming up from that central area. So I mentioned that lockdowns kind of helped us get a bit of a better picture of things too, because so many people are reporting their sightings, which is great. Without everybody, we really would struggle. And um, one thing that we've seen is from 2019 here to 2020 is a couple of grey squirrels moving in. And um, so we now know that there's a few more using these routes out and also coming up from Glasgow here, and that we can then try and concentrate on those when we've got the resources and everybody in place to do that. And these are areas that we can target. So it really helps us to focus on where we need to target grey squirrel control. So yes, COVID restrictions have been quite horrible um, and very restricting, but actually they've really helped us to understand a lot more about what's happening. Um, and also prove that our work does actually work um, without the control that was happening to as big an, as an extent as it usually does, um, grey squirrels start to move in, which basically means that we are doing what we need to do and we're controlling them normally. Um, that a constant effort is needed, um, even just a small gap in a couple of months means that grey squirrels can move back in, and that people working locally are really essential, um, especially if you can't move very much. So I wouldn't have been able to go and control anything in Sterling, I'm based in Balloch, um, so it really is quite tricky, um, and we do have to have those local networks in place. Just a little bit about squirrel pox outbreaks, as I've mentioned that grey squirrel control um, can really help with squirrel pox and stopping that getting to the reds. In the southeast region, uh, by Peebles, by this little red star, um, unfortunately during lockdown there was a squirrel pox outbreak in red squirrels. And normally what would happen is big staff teams would go out and they'd fly everywhere, they'd talk to loads of people, they'd try and get everyone on high alert to keep an eye out for squirrels, um, poorly ones, keep an eye out for greys as well. Um, and do some extensive control, all of the staff would go and control in that specific area just to try and reduce the amount of overlap between the two species. Um, unfortunately, all the staff were under the five mile lockdown limit, so it really was volunteers locally in the network groups that saved the day. They were able to go out, let everyone know what was happening. Um, normally we put things in the newspapers too, unfortunately because Covid was obviously an important news story of the day, um, they got kind of ignored. Um, but it really was the local networks helping to go out and do control in people's gardens, um, surrounding some areas to get some permission, um, staying local, abiding by all the government guidelines, but they actually managed um, to stop the outbreak getting too severe. And thankfully, there's still fantastic um, red squirrel populations in that area. And without those local groups, we really would have struggled to keep those red squirrels healthy in that region. A little bit about locally, um, so squirrel box isn't established in the area um, that I cover at the moment. We do get the occasional positive results only in grey squirrels, not in red, and that tends to be between Stirling and Falkirk and around Erskine. 
Thankfully, we didn't have any last year, which is great. It's not very well established because we only have one or two individuals um, occasionally that show signs of having um, been exposed to it. Unfortunately, it's a slightly different story in the south of Scotland. It is established. Um, it is very similar to that in England, where about 60% of grey squirrels carry the disease. So it's quite high. Um, we did. We found that in 2007, um, squirrelpox had reached some red squirrel populations just on the border. And um, as a result of that and kind of tracking it over time, um, the project decided to do a really good survey of all grey squirrels across the country in 2013-2014 and found out that actually in South Scotland it's pretty similar to England and about 60% of the grey squirrels have pox carry it. Um, but we have shown in those areas that actually grey squirrel control can reduce the impact of squirrel pox on red squirrel populations by keeping the two apart. That's the best way forwards. Um, it's not here yet but we do know that it is slowly moving up the country because it has moved up into South Scotland from England. Um, that's where it was, grey squirrels were introduced with it. Um, thankfully in Scotland, none of them were introduced from America with squirrel pox. It has just moved north through the UK. So we are keeping an eye. Um, we'd ask people to also keep an eye out on red squirrel populations, even though it's not here, it can jump. Um, so we do need to be a bit vigilant. It is quite close, especially between Stirling and Falkirk in the greys. So if anyone does see an injured um, or poorly looking red squirrel, please let us know. Um, we can also, if you find a dead red squirrel, even if it doesn't look injured, um, it's worthwhile sending it in for a post-mortem. We're working with the University of Edinburgh with the veterinary school um, to find out other diseases that may affect red squirrels and trying to um, see what's going on um, with their susceptibility to those. So um, for any more information about that, please have a look at our website or just get in touch with one other team. So I mentioned people are really important and we definitely couldn't do things without our volunteers. They have so many different roles um, just across the board. They help with the feeder box surveys, with grey squirrel control, with squirrel box um, surveillance, outreach events. Um, if anyone's got any fundraising ideas, I'd love to hear them because that's not my forte. Um, but anyone can be um, a squirrel spotter without actually signing up to be a volunteer too. So what you can do is you can have a look in your local area, have a look in your garden. Um, if you've got woodland behind your house and it's public woodland as opposed to private, um, then please go and have a look. Um, let us know what you see because it really is where people and squirrels are. Um, one thing I would advise is make sure you're only going in your own areas or in public woodland. Please do not go onto private property unless you've got permission, of course. Um, I know a lot of people are also using trail wildlife cameras and um, by all means use these and also you can report things that you find on those into our sightings website but please make sure you've got permission to put them up in your garden that's fine and um, you've also got to be really careful about images of people and um, there are really strict rules and regulations if anyone's got any queries about that please get in touch um, we do have quite a strong data protocol that we have to abide by um, because public images um, images are now classified as private so there's a couple of different ways that you can help uh, the main one is by reporting your sightings, um, reds and grey squirrels on our website. You can do this any time of year. Um, if you have them visiting daily, I would suggest that you might not want to do them every single time you see them. Just occasionally with an update of the maximum amount of squirrels you've seen at one time would be fantastic. Uh, you could adopt a squirrel or donate to the project through the Scottish Wildlife Trust website. Or you can volunteer in your area. However, I would advise that at the moment our volunteering um, roles aren't working at capacity because um, of COVID restrictions. So uh, by all means, register your interest. You can sign up to do that on um, our community hub, but we may not be able to start you off straight away. And that's everything from me. Um, thank you. I'm just gonna share my contact details. And um, we've also got our website there, our Facebook and our Twitter handle. Um, but please, if you've got any questions, just get in touch with us. All our contact details are also on our website. Um, and also all the links to Facebook and Twitter, so scottishsquirrels.org.uk. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing now. Brilliant. Thank you, Matt. There we go. Um, right. We've got a couple of questions that have popped up that are um, mm -hmm. great ones for you. Um, so one of the questions that came up was, how do you validate sightings? Okay, yep. Um, so... Every sighting that comes in, if you don't see it straight away, don't panic because they have to be validated by a member of the staff. Um, we also have some key volunteers um, that have been trained to do it. So um, 
partly from experience. So I've been with the project since 2016, and so I've got a pretty good idea of where squirrels are. Um, for the population that sprung up in Falkirk that I mentioned um, of the Reds, we don't validate them straight away. They don't go on the public website immediately. We have to confirm that they're there. Um, so we do this by talking to the people. Quite often people have had taken photographs. We also uh, try to get a couple of sightings in rather than just one or two. Um, because if red squirrels are trying to establish themselves in that area, we don't want to scare them away. Um, and quite often people will look at our website to find out where squirrels are nearest to them to go and see them. So we really don't want to encourage people too soon. We want to make sure they're established first. Um, so partly knowing where they are um, by other people reporting sightings. So having quite a few in an area is a really good indication that they're probably there. Um, it might be one or two. Um, and also we can go out and have another extra look. If um, in a couple of instances, some of the squirrels are either black or white rather than the normal gray or red. Um, quite often we get someone out on the ground to go and have a look or we're in touch with all the local council ranges, um, all sorts of people, local estates, we'll get in touch and just confirm if they've seen a black or a white squirrel and if they know which species it is. Otherwise, we'll um, go out and have a look as much as we possibly can. Sorry, my cat's trying to get into the room. <laughs> distracting me slightly. Great, thank you. Um, there's just a few more that I'll just run through re really quickly. Um, mm -hmm. So there's been a question about um, any release programs. Now this isn't something that we're um, involved in, but Marianne, I don't know if you know of any release programs um, that are worth having a wee um, mention yeah, of. so um, as Kaylee mentioned, we don't tend to do the release. Our main aim is to try and remove grey squirrels because we work in those overlap areas and then red squirrels will kind of move in of their own accord without having to do a reintroduction because we you do really need to be very careful on how much habitat's available if things are correct for them because it might not be the best habitat anymore for them so that you've got to be quite careful. One of the main um, people in Scotland that have done uh, reintroductions is Trees for Life and it's really worth having a look at their website and um, they've done some amazing things. They've moved some squirrels from um, Aberdeenshire across into the Highlands where they used to be um, but they've just um, dwindled in population so I think mainly from forestry reasons and less connectivity and so they're kind of boosting the populations over there and they're fantastic um, to have a chat with. Brilliant. And um, one of the other ones that popped up was, um, are greys moving into red zones because of population stress on their current habitats? Um, if, this is, if this is the case, is there anything to be done to restrict numbers in grey population areas? Okay. I think I followed that one. Um, <laughs> Sorry, so, one, one. Um, no, 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 that's okay. Um, so there is definitely... Um, Kind of habitat restrictions in terms of the areas that they they have available as it were. Um, as I showed before, red squirrels were throughout the whole of the UK so quite often they are connected or thought to just be associated with um, conifers, so all the pine trees. That's actually not the case, they can survive extremely well in broadleaf areas apart from the fact that greys do extremely well in those areas. Um, there's 60 different species of oak tree in America so they've actually evolved to take over and use oak and all sorts um, to the best of their ability. And so there is a bit of a pressure in those areas specifically, um, which is why we're quite careful in advising people about planting woodland and that maybe they could create corridors for greys by accident if they plant broadleafs. Um, I'm not sure if that really answered all the question. Um, but there are definitely pressures and that's also why it's important to report your sightings because it then feeds into that National um, Biodiversity Network Atlas. And then if people are doing planning or looking at forestry, then they know what are hotspots um, for that kind of pressure and maybe they can do something about it before we need to. Great, and um, the questions are rolling in, which is, is great to see that everyone's um, so intrigued. Um, so there's just two, two ones that have come up that we can maybe quickly cover, um, and then I think it might be um, time to, to maybe pass back over to Tom. But um, the, one of them was um, about a squirrel pox cure or a vaccine in the future. And I know that there's quite a lot of different um, things and process at the moment we very much work on um what what we've got available at the moment but Marianne I don't know if you know of any sort of research 
that's being done at the moment that might be worth mentioning? Yeah, so um, UK Squirrel Accord have been working with quite a lot of different things with this. Um, so a vaccine is quite tricky because um, only about mm, five to ten percent of a red squirrel population could survive. Normally it's not that high. Um, you don't want to mess with them too much, so you don't want to go and try and trap them and find out what the antibodies they are that they've got, as you don't want to kind of um, stress them out any further than they already are. If they're managing to survive the pox, that's great, but it does mean it's quite tricky to understand why they're surviving and therefore to develop a vaccine for it. Um, one thing that a couple of um, people have looked at is maybe trying to give something to the greys, um, both as a vaccine or as a contraceptive to the greys to therefore um, reduce the population without us having to do control because it's a much nicer idea. Um, again, I'm not sure that anyone's got too far with that as um, we're all beginning to understand with COVID, it can be quite tricky to develop things like that um, and it can take a lot of time. Anything that has to be developed either for the vaccine or for the contraception needs to be squirrel specific um, because squirrelpox virus is just squirrel specific. Um, it is quite hard to understand what's going on. Um, I know both the red and grey squirrel genomes have now been um, sorted out, so that's a nice template for everybody to use. So maybe we'll start to see a few more developments. Um, unfortunately, it all just does cost money and it takes a long time. Um, we are hoping that something will be developed in the near-ish future. Um, UK Squirrel Accord are the main ones looking at contraception, so if you wanted to um, have any updates on that, they also need to try and find out how to deliver that as well, um, because what they have been looking at is a mammal specific so obviously you need to then reduce that down to a squirrel specific and then you also need to reduce that down to a gray squirrel specific rather than red squirrels and um, so they are having quite a few issues with that and i imagine a similar thing might have to be done with a vaccine just in case it has any other negative effects on any other species brilliant thank you um and um i'll try and squeeze in one more um, do red squirrels offer any particular ecosystem services that we need to look after? Okay, yeah. Um, so this time of year, they're about to start getting really busy. You'll see them on the ground a lot more um, because they don't hibernate. Um, they are awake and running around over winter. So at this time of year, they're getting all those nuts and seeds that are falling off the trees and they're burying them. Um, partly so they've got these little stores that are dotted all around the woodland. Um, that when they do need to come down and eat from their jays, they can do it really quickly, they know where that food is and they can go straight back up again and only when it's nice. So for the most of the time we just don't see them because they're hiding away and they're sensible. Um, but they don't always necessarily remember where they buried them. Um, so it does mean they're actually planting trees for us, which is great. Um, they're tree species that they like. Um, they tend to, they're really good at finding nuts that will last. And um, so they'll shake them and they'll sniff them. They can find a nut that's buried like two meters underground. And they know that those are gonna be the things that will survive. And therefore they're the ones that are probably gonna be the best to actually um, grow if they get forgotten about. So that's a really important thing they do. They do um, also occasionally eat insects. So that can reduce the insect population a little bit. Um, they are really, um, they don't just eat nuts and seeds, they eat all sorts of things. So they'll eat flowers, they'll eat fruit. So they'll then also disperse all the seeds from the fruit um, and they can move some of the pollen around too. So they do do quite a lot. Um, when it tends to be, we focus on them burying the nuts and seeds, but there's all sorts of different bits and pieces they do almost by accident. Great, brilliant, thank you. Um, and thank you for everyone for submitting questions there. If I have missed you, I will, I will skim through and try and come back to you. Um, but that was some, some great questions coming in. Thanks, everyone. Um, Kayleigh, uh, Marianne, I think there was a question earlier on. Uh, someone had asked about why it was that the um, grey squirrels were more susceptible to pine marten predation than the reds. Mm, okay. Um, yep, yeah, so for those who don't know, there's been quite a lot of research done in the past couple of years in Ireland and then now in Scotland too. Um, and then back in Ireland again recently, um, looking at the uh, association between reds and greys and pine martins. Um, pine martins do eat squirrels, um, they tend not to eat red squirrels as much as greys and there's a couple of theories as to why this is. Um, so one is that the grey squirrels tend to spend a lot more time on the ground foraging and therefore they're a bit easier prey for the pine martins. 
One of the other ones is that um, a grey squirrel is twice as heavy as a red squirrel and a pine martin is even bigger than a grey. Um, so it's thought that the red squirrels being so light they can get up onto the teeny tiny branches at the top of the trees and that a grey squirrel can't get to and a pine martin can't follow because they're just too big and heavy. Um, so that's a couple of suggestions as to why. Um, there's also been some more recent research suggesting that um, pine martins may not be the solution for grey squirrels in urban areas because um, grey squirrels seem to be a bit more protected in urban areas. Um, so there is quite an interesting um, relationship between all three of those. We've also found that where we've removed grey squirrels from an area, red squirrels and pine martins have moved back in. So there also seems to be something about the amount of grey squirrels that are in an area and pine martins. So we need to remove the bulk of them first and then pine martins will kind of mop it up afterwards. Um, so I hope that helps. Another one that I heard um, recently, Marianne, was uh, that um, pine martins can help red squirrels because they eat a lot of um, voles and other things that are going to be competing for the same food supplies. So, um, yeah, that would make sense. Yeah, there's all sorts of theories. <laughs> they also eat a lot of fruit um, and things too, though, so they compete a little bit. So, um, yeah, it's a tricky one to kind of fathom and figure out at the moment. But yeah, that could indeed help. There was another question I think um, someone asked about. Um, whether you had targets for um, eradication of greys, I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, but uh, That's right. <laughs> looking for um, total eradication of greys or more containment, I think. Um, whoever it was that asked that question, if I got that wrong, please do flag <laughs> it up in the chat. Um, suggest it. Yeah, so as I mentioned uh, near the beginning, we've got different things depending on the area because of the different pressures from grey squirrels. So up in Aberdeen, it's an isolated population of grey squirrels, so we are aiming for complete eradication. Um, there's not more grey squirrels that are filtering in, it's just them there. Um, admittedly, they're breeding, so obviously the population's increasing a little bit if we don't get to them in time. But for the most part, it's a much easier self-contained area to remove those grey squirrels. Um, in the central belt, which is where I work, it's a bit trickier, partly because you've got a bit between us and the South Scotland teams where there's just grey squirrels. So they're constantly kind of feeding back in and dispersing both north and south and kind of filling back in. I mean, it'd be great to eradicate all the greys, um, but you're always going to have them coming up from South Scotland, from England as well. Um, and we're working quite closely in those regions with um, red squirrels in North England uh, because it needs to be a concerted effort with everybody. Um, so, I mean, it'd be great. We are managing to eradicate them out of some areas, but I can't say that they'll be gone from um, the central belt within so many years. It unfortunately doesn't happen like that. Um, squirrel populations are quite reliant on what food's available in the autumn. So last year we had quite a big boom in the nuts and seeds that were available. It was phenomenal. Um, and actually there were still a lot of nuts and seeds still available in the springtime that hadn't been collected. Um, this meant that it was really good for squirrels. The mild um, winter also helped because a lot more survived, which is great. It meant we saw way more red squirrels than we ever thought possible in some areas, but it also boosted the gray squirrel population too. Um, so as kind of COVID hit, we then had a bit of a panic that um, we would be a bit swamped by greys moving back in um, because there are these populations. Unfortunately, we can't do anything outside of the regions we cover at the moment, uh, but hopefully we'll just push that line further south over time and just contain them um, more as we go. But we'll see. Maybe eradication, but I'm not quite sure how far in the future that would be. be lovely, though. One um, question I had, Marianne, which um, is something that quite a few people have um, put to me recently um, visitors to our squirrel hides um, is um, you know if they are finding that grey squirrels are coming into their gardens wherever they are um, coming in for peanuts that they might be putting out for the birds should they continue to feed peanuts? I don't yeah. Have a view on that. yeah it's quite tricky because if you don't feed peanuts and you feed other bird feed they'll still go for the bird feeder anyway. Um, I know that there's a lot of people that have tried squirrel proof feeders I would say do not waste your money, they never seem to work. I still haven't figured out a way to dissuade squirrels and um, I've seen squirrels run off with bird feeders they couldn't get into just to kind of destroy it elsewhere. Um, so don't waste your money on those. Um, I mean we tend to, people love feeding wildlife in the garden like I do too um, and it can be quite tricky um, because we don't want to dissuade people from doing that. Obviously it's quite helpful. Um, in the summertime it's quite helpful for squirrels 
to have a bit extra red um, because that's the time of year that they don't have as much natural food available. Um, but if there are red and grey squirrels coming to the garden, especially if they're in a squirrel pox area, we would suggest not feeding them as much. Um, it's also quite good not to have a food source all the time because they can be a bit reliant on it and you want to make sure they don't become reliant. They tend to be quite good in mixing up their food habits anyway. They're quite good at having a varied diet, so they won't necessarily rely on your bird feeder. Um, but it is something to bear in mind that maybe you want to, if you do have grey squirrels coming quite a lot, you might want to just take it down for a little while and stop feeding and then put it back out. It might take them a little bit longer than the birds to find. Um, so you can do this every so often just to get everything a break. And one thing I would say is just make sure that the feeders are always cleaned every so often, um, both for squirrels and for birds as well, because it can do a lot of um, wildlife disease spread just in bird feeders because everything congregates at them. Thanks, that, Marianne. Another um, thing, so just um, maybe more of a, an observation than a question, but um, some of you um, that have tuned in tonight, folks will know that um, we've done quite a few of these talks with really um, um, in the past few years. And um, I don't know if you know this actually, Miriam, but after the last one that we did, um, there was someone who um, came up to me at the end and I think they were quite horrified about the um, reality of the grey control. Um, yeah. They were very much kind of uh, making the point of um, what, why do, why would we decide that one animal you know belongs more than another um and i think i probably slightly fudged the answer at the time and um is i've thought about it quite a lot since then and um i guess maybe i'm kind of quite glad that you're being so direct about um, showing pictures of the squirrel box i think the reality of why we do it here why we still control grays is um that i think you know it's far more humane to um, to humanely dispatch a grey squirrel than let the reds die of the pox or be pushed out and um, lack food and everything like that and risk starvation. So uh, maybe just an observation on that. I suspect it's probably um, preaching to the converted with the audience tonight, but um, just for people that are maybe thinking about it, something that's kind of been in my head since then. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I mean, it is it is quite a delicate topic. I completely understand. Um, and you'll notice I don't go into too much detail about how things are done because um, I don't think that's fair to people. Like some people don't want to know. That's fine. Um, and I don't have anything against grey squirrels. I'm from London originally. I also um, went to uni in Staffordshire where their emblem was a grey squirrel. Um, so I don't think it's their fault. It's the fact that we've kind of introduced them and they are having such a big impact on other species, not just reds either. Um, obviously they kind of uh, combat with us a little bit about forestry and they do strip bark off trees, but we've kind of made that happen a little bit too. Um, there is some suggestion that maybe they can affect um, small bird populations. Again, that's um, still under investigation. So, I mean, it isn't a nice thing to do. Um, if we didn't control them in some way, then we wouldn't have red squirrels in this country at all. It just wouldn't happen. Um, so that's kind of the main thing that I kind of hold true, as it were. Absolutely, no, quite agree. Um, folks, I don't know if there's um, another wee comment just came in there, just see what that was. Um, you mentioned the odd red who survives the pox virus. Can these be caught and their immunity be tested? Uh, so um, I think you kind of dealt with that a bit, just the delicate... Sorry. Because squirrels are so, um, I, I guess, so delicate, um, so, you know, so um, prone to stress. I think um, that's probably the reality of that, right, but trying yeah. to catch... Um, actually stressing them out and them dying in any kind of trap right yeah we they're... try not to interfere with the ones that survive too much because obviously they're surviving and hopefully they'll pass that on to um their future so if we start dabbling with that we could take away those immune individuals or those individuals that somehow managed to escape and um, so we don't until we're getting a bit better kind of immunity from it we don't really want to kind of chase down healthy squirrels and catch them just to try and take a blood sample because it can be quite invasive and it can stress them out. They're quite little too. Um, so you really don't want to, yeah, kind of do that. So I guess um, the second part of the question of that was, um, are squirrels ever tagged or tracked in any way to monitor their movements? But I guess that would come into the same category then. Sorry, you kind of broke up on me there, Tom. I kind of missed the important middle bit. 
the second part of the question was um, whether squirrels are ever um, tracked in any way, tagged or tracked to monitor their movements. But um, I guess that would fall into the same category of having to catch them first, right? Yeah, so they're um, a protected species. So we actually have, with all the work that we do, because we can accidentally um, catch red squirrels and obviously release them immediately, we're not allowed to handle them in any other way. Um, they are, you have to get a permit for any handling because they are protected um, and are so precious. So for instance, the Trees for Life project where they are moving squirrels, what they'll do is with those squirrels, because they're catching them and moving them anyway, they'll do a whole kind of um, check over and look for diseases. So that is a really um, good way of doing it. So they'll be able to do that, but we don't want to do anything like that unnecessarily. Um, we also may have quite a few traps open in an area so we don't want to leave any squirrel red or grey in a trap for too long so we don't have time to do any extra bits and we also want to make sure we're not interfering with those populations unnecessarily hence partly why we do the hair samples in the feeder boxes because then we don't actually have to trap anything. Great. Um, Mac, I think that's all the questions that came up on the um, chat. So okay. folks if there's anyone that wants to ask any questions in person um, please do feel free now is the time if you want to unmute yourself if there's anything else that people would like to ask a lot of it is people reporting more sightings because they're at home or work, uh, walking in their local areas and therefore they may be taking a bit more notice because they don't have anywhere to go and they're going around the same routes so they're going oh there's a squirrel there um, so that sort of thing has been really interesting and it means that I have been able to see grey squirrels kind of moving through areas um, and kind of seeing roughly what routes they take very roughly um, because we might be missing bits of information because of sightings. Um, we've also found that red squirrels have been cropping up in more places with kittens than we realised so we knew they were maybe breeding in that area but then suddenly there's like 10 kittens that are on someone's porch and that's at least two um, family if not three families in quite close proximity so that's quite surprising um, so I mean it has been both good and bad it's been tricky because we've had these grey sightings that are moving back into areas and we haven't been able to do anything about them um, a lot of that was happening around kind of between the Sterling and Calendar area so Dune, Dunblane, Bridge of Allen they're quite key areas because the greys are moving from Sterling up and we're trying to kind of push them a bit further south um, and we normally have a lot of estates such as Gati and many others and also a volunteer that's quite active in the area but because he works with homeowners and goes into their garden and that couldn't happen we did see a massive spike in grey squirrel sightings because um, a lot of people in that area know to kind of keep an eye out. Um, thankfully we seem to have got people back in place and things going again and now we've reduced it again but it did show how important it was to have that happening there because otherwise those greys would have carried on spreading further out um, so there has been some interesting insight it'll be interesting to see what happens um, next year as well and kind of see we were expecting a boom in both populations this year because of really good food last autumn and the mild winter and so we were expecting it a little bit um, and I think it's just maybe they've moved a bit further and um, we'll see if there's any other interesting insights um, kind of as we move into the new year I think and see what happens over winter but um, there's been yeah some interesting bits and it doesn't it's definitely confirmed that where we're placing our efforts is where it needs to be as well. I think what we've been seeing on the ground here probably um yeah, very much shows um, exactly what you're saying. I think our red numbers have never been higher here um, and we're seeing them all over but um, with the absence of people trapping in the local area we've had more greys coming on to the place than there have been for quite a number of years now. Mm. Um, so quite a lot of sightings so it does kind of seem to show that um, a mild winter um, going into a heat wave spring does seem to have benefited both of them and then lockdown perhaps couldn't have come at a worse time unfortunately for the grey monitoring. Yeah. So I guess folks yeah that's um, a great reason to you know be reporting the sightings and doing all the things that Marianne has been talking about tonight. Folks are there any other questions people would like to ask? Okay, great. Well, guys, thank you very much for tuning in tonight. It's really, really heartening to have so many people tuning in for a um, Zoom webinar. I know they're not the easiest things compared to a physical meeting, but it's really, really great to see so many people have been on. Um, thank you as well to Marianne and to Kaylee 
um, for tonight. It's really, really great the work that you guys are doing and so important. So we're really, really pleased to have been able to host this. Folks, um, please do think about reporting your sightings at the very least. And if you're interested in getting involved in feeder box surveys or all the other things, please do think about that because it's such important work. And if we want to keep the red squirrels, it really does need people like you. So thank you again, everyone, for tuning in tonight. Thank you to Mary Ann. Thank you to Kaylee. And yeah, we'll hopefully see you in person sometime soon. Thanks, folks. Good night. Thank you. Bye.